Test 5, Part 2, Passage 3. Listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Okay, today we're going to be looking at the aspects that make a natural pearl very different from a cultured pearl. Now I'll be focusing on natural pearls, although I will say something about cultured pearls. Well, maybe I should point out that the cultured pearl industry was established after natural pearls became very rare. The natural pearl trade in the 16th century was so extensive that by the last quarter of the 19th century, the supply seemed to have been exhausted. And with the ever present demand for pearls, well, people started thinking about how to induce mollusks to produce pearls, cultured pearls under controlled conditions. So, what's a mollusk, anyone? Well, I guess most of you would think that mollusks are oysters. Um, that's one species of mollusk. But mollusks are a pretty diverse group known as phyla mollusca. They range from organisms as small as the minuscule tiny snail, which is about the size of a button on your shirt, to larger animals such as squid and octopi. Yes, the octopus is one of the mollusk class. So, um, basically, the majority of mollusks have a mantle and a muscular foot that are both used to help them move. Now, what's a mantle? Well, it's a fold of the outer skin which lines the mollusk's shell, and it has a very definite role in the formation of a pearl.、Uh, by the way, in case you're curious, an octopus lacks a shell, but it does have a mantle located around its head. Generally, mollusks are found worldwide, although you'll find larger populations of them in certain areas, particularly where an abundant supply of food exists. They've adapted to all types of marine habitats. There are ten classes of mollusks, but only two, the bivalves and the gastropods, make pearls. Bivalves and gastropods take to both marine and freshwater areas, but only gastropods can survive on land. So, there are perhaps 75,000 species of gastropods, including slugs, snails, conch, cowries, abalone, and limpets, as you see pictured here on this slide. Well, These may be found in rocky, sandy, and muddy areas. These creatures may be herbivorous, carnivorous. They may even eat detritus, and they take in food with their teeth. Now, gastropods are able to move, which makes them less likely to produce pearls. Interestingly, the more capable a mollusk is of moving, the less likely it is to produce pearls. The bivalve mollusks, on the other hand, are not as capable of moving freely. There are two part shells with both valves being symmetrical from the hinge line, as you see here on this slide. The scallops, clams, oysters, and mussels. They eat by siphoning food particles from the water they breathe in through their gills, and these same gills filter out particles that are not digested. The、uh, bivalve species produce 80% of the world's pearl output. So, how does the pearl form? Okay. Um, basically, it's a biological process. The mollusk's way of protecting itself from those foreign particles that irritate its tissues. Now, the mantle is the organ that produces the oyster's shell. Obviously, as the oyster grows, its shell will grow as well, and the mantle produces a material called nacre. It is nacre that lines the inside of the oyster's shell and strengthens it. Okay, so the hinge between the two valves keeps the oyster's shell open. And the seawater or fresh water enters, and there's a foreign substance which enters and begins to irritate the mantle. We can think of it as a speck of dust getting in your eye. Your eye gets red, and your tear duct produces tears to wash away the speck. Well, the mantle reacts in the same way. It seeks to protect itself by covering up the thing that's irritating it, and it uses the same substance, nacre, to envelop the particle or substance. What is this nacre made of? It's actually calcium carbonate, which is in the form of aragonite or calcite, a crystalline form of calcium carbonate. This secretion is held together by an organic compound called conchylin. It's a bone-like substance, and when this nacre is secreted, it's it's not like a big blob of it surrounds the irritant. It's layer upon layer of nacre over a period of many years. Now most natural pearls are baroque or uneven. Very few pearls turn out perfectly round or perfectly oval. These are extremely rare, very valuable, and very costly.
hardly anyone finds them today. Those that exist cost millions of dollars. Most perfectly round pearls that are produced today are cultured pearls. So, what's the difference between a perfectly round natural pearl and a perfectly round cultured one? Plenty. The process by which a cultured pearl is made is the same. The irritant enters, the mantle gets irritated, secretes nacre, coats the irritant with a layer of nacre. But the first step is deliberate. A harvester cuts a slit in the mantle and inserts a small round irritant. So while the natural pearl is 100% nacre, the cultured pearl is not. In fact, it has only a thin layer of nacre on the surface. That is why the glow of the cultured pearl appears to be only on the surface, whereas that of the natural pearl seems to come from deep within. But there are easier ways to tell the difference. If you rub a cultured pearl against the biting edge of your front tooth, it will feel smooth, but a natural pearl will feel a bit gritty. And of course, you can always have a jeweler subject the pearl to an X-ray to determine what is at the pearl's core, if it's all nacre or if it has some synthetic core. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Twelve. What does the professor mainly discuss? Thirteen, according to the professor, what two purposes does nacre serve? Listen again to a part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, what's a mantle? Well, it's a fold of the outer skin which lines the mollusk's shell, and it has a very definite role in the formation of a pearl. Ah,、uh, by the way, in case you're curious, an octopus lacks a shell, but it does have a mantle located around its head. Fourteen. What does the professor mean when he says this? Ah,、uh, by the way. In case you're curious. Fifteen. What does the professor say about gastropods? Sixteen, in the lecture, the professor explains the sequence of steps that takes place in the formation of a natural pearl. Put the steps listed below in the correct order.
17. According to the professor, what are the ways to differentiate between natural pearls and cultured ones? Test 5, Part 1, Passage 2 Listen to part of a talk on geology. Okay, we're talking about caves today, and I'd like to tell you about the deepest limestone cave in the United States, the Lechaguilla Cave. I have never been to this cave because it isn't open to the general public. The only people who have been allowed to enter this cave are scientific teams and explorers who have received approval. Um, until the year 1986, Lechuguilla was believed to be a small and inconsequential cave of the Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. But cavers doing some exploring heard the roaring of wind from the floor of the cave, and with permission from national park authorities, they started doing some serious investigating. And they found a cave of unbelievable depth and beauty. Its rooms were so pristine that the park officials decided to limit visits to the cave. So, no one but those explorers and some photographers has actually been in Lechuguilla. So, I'll be focusing on how limestone caves are formed, and I'll be discussing the Lechuguilla cave in particular because scientists once believed that all limestone caves were formed by water, but they changed their minds after they studied it. Before I move on to a discussion of how Lechuguilla was formed, I'd like to talk for a minute about how water can form a limestone cave. Well, most, uh, perhaps 90% of limestone caves are formed in the, um, in the traditional manner. Now, the description I will give you will sound simple, but the whole process is really a bit more complex. Limestone is highly soluble in water that's enriched with carbonic acid, which is formed when carbon dioxide mixes with water, and it's a fairly weak acid, but that acid plays a big role in the formation of caves. So, what happens is, rainwater enters the soil, and when it mixes with dead plant material, it picks up the carbon dioxide in this decaying material. And then, this enriched water seeps through the soil layers down to the water table, which is also known as groundwater. Now, the uh, limestone layers of the earth... I think you all know that limestone is a sedimentary rock, and it's made mostly of calcium carbonate. Well, limestone has tiny pores and cracks, and the carbonic acid water finds its way into these little holes and cracks and starts to dissolve the limestone. Do you get the picture? It'll take some years, but the holes and cracks will get larger and larger, and this erosion will make it easier for the water to begin forming small chambers or rooms in the rock. If the water pressure, called hydrostatic pressure, if this pressure is strong enough, it could erode the limestone at a very quick pace. Actually, nobody knows how many years it takes for a cave to form, but some scientists have begun to find evidence that it takes just thousands of years and not millions as was traditionally believed. So, as time passes, the water forms a cave that is large enough for humans to walk in. As I said, most caves are formed by enriched water. However, a few, such as the Lechuguilla Cave, aren't. How do scientists know this? Well, um, limestone caves typically have tracks where the liquid flowed through the limestone. But the Lechuguilla Cave does not have these tracks. So, what could have carved out this cave? Uh, geologists noted that the limestone walls of Lechuguilla had enormous deposits of gypsum, you can't find gypsum in water-made limestone caves. So the presence of this gypsum indicated to the scientists that it wasn't runoff that had formed the cave, but some other very strong substance. They figured out that hydrogen sulfide gas was rising from a subterranean source. In fact, reservoirs of oil were giving off sulfurous fumes. This gas reached the groundwater and mixed with it to form sulfuric acid. Uh, if you know what sulfuric acid is, well, 
That stuff can eat through limestone like bleach poured on silk. The acid then ate away at the limestone and dissolved it from below, rather than percolating down from above. At first, not many scientists accepted the idea that sulfuric acid was the sculptor of the Lechagia cave, but when scientists examined the cave and discovered it had formed much more quickly than a cave formed by rainwater, the idea was confirmed. There was evidence of rising acid-rich springs in every chamber. The cave had definitely been built from the bottom up. The geologists found other stuff besides gypsum. There was sulfur, manganese, iron, and other elements. And this is why the Lechagia is especially colorful, and its formation so completely bizarre. Just out of this world, I tell you. The acid is capable of forming some really fantastic shapes. And interestingly, the rooms are all different. It's as if each chamber has certain qualities that allowed particular formations or colors. I'm just curious, is there still acid in that cave? No, it's a dormant cave, meaning the cave-forming process isn't happening. The uh, hydrogen sulfide isn't oxidizing into sulfuric acid, so the acid smell isn't as strong as it must have been when the cave was in the developmental stage. Geologists know this because in active caves, the smell is very strong, and this indicates dangerous levels of sulfuric acid. It's a really bad rotting egg smell. So cave explorers need to protect themselves when they go exploring active, acid-made caves. I mean, not just from the bad odor, but from the hydrogen sulfide itself. That stuff can kill you in a matter of seconds if you breathe it in. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 6. What does the professor mainly discuss? Seven, according to the professor, why does Lechagia have such varied colors? Eight. In the lecture, the professor explains the sequence of steps that take place when carbonic acid water forms limestone caves. Put the steps listed below in the correct order. Nine. What does the professor imply about sulfuric acid made caves? Ten. 
According to the professor, what are two characteristics of the Lechagia cave? Listen again to a part of the lecture, then answer the question. Uh, if you know what sulfuric acid is, well, that stuff can eat through limestone like bleach poured on silk. The acid then ate away at the limestone and dissolved it from below, rather than percolating down from above. 11. Why does the professor say this? That stuff can eat through limestone like bleach poured on silk. 